And here he goes again with another pass. A6. It's not to keep the knight out at all. It's just a waiting game we're playing here. If I were a mind reader, I would say he might have an idea of knight A8. And that's not a misprint. He might put the knight on C7 and then put the pawn on B5. So that would be the idea behind A6, to put his knight on C7 and a pawn on B5 and fight back on the queen side. The whole time leaving this unresolved. So that could be what he had in mind, in a long-term idea. But I don't think he has that kind of luxurious time. So after D3, A6, it's a long-term plan to assail me on the C4 square. So, A6. Oh, by the way, don't tell anybody about knight A8. That's, 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 that's a secret. <laughs> People aren't supposed to know. The only thing that can be said is that his B6 knight finally got something to chew on. But at what cost? So, he wouldn't part with his good bishop. We've had the discussion of how, how valuable that bishop is. And now the half bad bishop here has become fully bad. So, trading off his good bishop would be positional capitulation. As it turns out, he wanted to get rid of that knight so bad anyway. <laughs> oh well. It's not helping though. Now I start stretching out the diagonals toward the king with this move. Ah. And the threat of h7 is very powerful. He's got to weaken something. Oh, no, he doesn't. He refuses to weaken his pawn structure. I thought he would weaken the cover in front of the king. He wouldn't. Not right away. He says, I'm going to fight you like this. He, he, that pawn cluster would be quite useful in defending his king. And so if I trade, he takes back, and the pawn cluster is okay. And that's when I finally decided. Frankly speaking, if he could play without this pawn, he probably would. He'd be like, I, I'd rather be down a past pawn than to have this blockade that's about to occur. At least he would have a useful diagonal. But after my next move, I make sure he can't even gamut a pawn. I seal the position completely. And now, except for the rather feeble b5 shot, he's not going to be going far. The weakness of f6 precludes any kingside moves. I own the kingside. And I'm thinking that I can play g4, g5 in some cases. But I'm going to be careful before I open up my king, no matter what. He is a grandmaster after all. Mm. So, after knight e4, Varjun came up with an idea, I think, to run his king away. Like they used to do in the old days, they'd take their king and they'd run it over here and hide it over here. <laughs> so, but it's a long, it's a long run. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. But even, even before I can start running, though, there's, there's a problem with this pawn over here. So, but he sees this impending g4, g5 nonsense coming and break in with knight f6 check or do something on this pawn. I said, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll just play bishop c1. I said, well, why play bishop c1 now and leave my rook languishing in the corner? Because I, let's go ahead with a touch of class here, I decided. And this move just puts a nail in the coffin. This is classic overprotection from the school of Nimzovich. The e4 square is a very important square. Whereas my minor pieces are, are there, just putting a rook on that square overprotects the square. And in some cases, this rook gets up and over, and in fact, this rook really does a heck, heck of a yeah, job. I think you wanted to say something about the knight, you were saying? Yeah, I thought maybe knight can take the pawn on f6. Yeah, the, the sacrifice is in the air. Right. I have to be careful when I do it, because when I sacrifice, and then it opens up his position for some defense. So everything has to be calculated. If I sacrifice the knight now, for instance, without analyzing, we don't have to analyze. If I sacrifice the knight now, look how far away my bishop is from the king. And the knight's gone. Yeah, the knight's feel. This is very high class defense, by the way, although it's a little comical. He's, he's running, but uh, we'll see how far he gets. Now, instead of the knee jerk bishop c1 move, I said, hey, wait, this guy's smart. He's trying to get out of the field. I said, I'll send something a little heavier than a, than a bishop. And I lift the rook. Because by putting the rook on g3, I can stop the king's running. The king is needed to defend that. And who knows, I might sacrifice a rook. That's right. Anything to take the clothes off that king, so. Rook e3 now is a very powerful move. And he went ahead with king e8. His plan is revealed. Smart guy, huh? So if I rook g3, he has bishop f8. And the king side comes together. Yeah. He stitches it together. And then the king can continue on its long-winded run. <laughs> so I said, hey, this guy is smart. Okay. Back to rook e3, king e8. I just waited. Bishop c1. I'm like, go ahead, put your bishop back on f8 if you want. First of all, I'm not attacking the g pawn. And there are probably many, many variations where you have to analyze this, this pawn breaking forward. 
to deflect the bishop, even if it came to that kind of situation, if, if I were here, here, here. So to break the blockade, should do. <laughs> to break the blockade right now, without provocation, is unnecessary. I, I repeat, to break the blockade right now, without provocation, is unnecessary. So, bishop c1, and this is when he played queen a5, a desperate looking move. It is desperate. He's hitting my a pawn. But, let's be honest, he's really making room for that king. He hasn't given up his idea. Three or four more moves, he might get out of this mess. And the queen was impeding the king's egress. <laughs> Telegraph. Oh, it's for the newspaper, the London Telegraph. The arts. It says, um, I'll read the whole thing, it's not long. The world champion, uh, Vladimir Kramnik, can make a million dollars as he plays Emory Tate. No. <laughs> as he, as he, uh, as he takes on the chess playing program, Deep Fritz, for a second time in a six-game match to be held from November 25th to December 5th at the German National Art and Exhibition Hall in Bonn. Kramnik's start money will be $500,000, and a match victory will double that. Deep Prince is billed as the world's strongest chess program and Kramnik battled to a draw in a match in Bahrain in 2002. Your correspondent, that's uh, Malcolm Payne, your correspondent was technical director for the first half of that match and the feeling was then that Kramnik should have won. He was 3-1 ahead, but tired in the second half. However, since then, Kramnik has had health problems struck the phase. I don't know that D6 has the same impetus. So, this is the end now. After Bishop takes H6. But that d6 and queen sack line is very artistic. Although the computer doesn't know it's artistic. We <laughs> units can't appreciate it. Bishop takes h6, x clamp. And he says also the queen sack thing. That's if he took on a2, though. It, it, would he really take on a2? <laughs> it's, it's not. But after this, he's compelled to take action. And now check. And I put his king in a horrible discovery. Boom. And by the way, his flight is cut short. They just canceled the last flight out of town. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to get to C7, the magic square, and to get to the safe haven. But uh, the knight prevents that. And he has to stay out here like the rest of us kind of passengers. <laughs> and he goes right there into the discovery. Utopia. He never made it. So, but. A 94 check, as I said, he can just go back to E8 instead of trying to run. And then to press ahead with the attack, I have to repeat the position. Check, yeah. So this phase of the game is by no means easy. And uh, this is one of my longest calculations of the game, just before I sacrificed. And I found knight G4 check. Hmm. Not merely winning the center pawn, but refocusing the knight's energy on E5 now. So when he goes here, knight e5 checks and hit that other loose minor piece. After knight g4 check, if king f6 stepping into the fire, he can. He's the queen. Excuse me, king dog six. If king d6 trying to hold that pawn the old-fashioned way, I had prepared, and now I guess Fritz confirms. Uh, queen f4 check. King has only one square. And now, more drama. <laughs> ah. And the F-file comes open. Everybody plays. And then he takes that. Pawn takes check. And mate's on the way. Says, uh, rook g6 check, bishop takes g6. Takes back here, check. He goes to G7. He goes to G7, I check here, and then mate here with the pawn. Just protecting me. He goes here. Looks like pretty simple to just go queen here, check, and let the rook invade on F7 next. Yeah. That should do it. We can golf up the knight, but that's made on the spot. It's like in the last game, we just showed that brilliant tactical game. Instead of playing rook to C2 and winning and letting the guy cough it up like that, well, from an aesthetic point of view now, queen E1 takes away all of his, all of his toys. He's going to lose his queen.
she's going to be traded on the spot. And without a queen to resist, and with further simplifications that coming down the E file, uh, and finally, it's an echo variation that my queen is now on the second time in the game mm -hmm. on E1. And that's an unusual square for the queen. Mm -hmm. So queen E1, and now back queen E1. It's a crowning move. And the game was over after queen takes queen. Queen. And the rooks stand firm. Three extra pawns. He traded. Then he, then he saw the power of the rooks. Oh, the rooks trapped. He can't go anywhere. The knight hasn't held hostage, so after rook takes, rook takes. He played about two more insignificant moves and resigned.